Let's see what the Bible says, has to say about him. In Genesis 14, if you remember, Lot chose the plain of Jordan. He went down to the Vale of Siddim, and he joined himself to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? That's where Lot went. Abram went down to Hebron, and he stayed there. There were these five kings who fought against these four kings, and the four big kings, led by Kedor Laomer, won, right? And Lot was taken captive. So Abraham, or before he's Abraham, Abram takes his trained servants, and he goes up, and he wipes out those armies, I guess, slays them in the night, very similar to how Gideon does it, and then he brings back Lot, okay? And here's where we are in the story. Genesis 14 and verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedor Laomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. Now, I looked up valley of Sheva and the king's dale and I studied and studied and guess what I got? I got no idea what King's Dale even means. I don't know where the Valley of Sheva is. I'm sorry. If you find it, you let me know. I don't even know what Dale means. <laughs> it's, I know it's a name. Uh, Dale, maybe it's like a valley, like Vale. I don't know. I'm not positive. I'm sure the Bible has the answer, but I haven't been able to find it yet. And I'm eager for the I'm Lord to show me and I'm praying about it. Farmer in the Dale, Farmer in the Vale. Farmer in the Dale. Farmer in the Dale. The Farmer in the Dale. The Farmer in the Dale? I don't know what that means, though. Is that Abram? He was a farmer in the Dale? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Well, the first man to come out and greet Abram is Sodom, apparently, the king of Sodom. And if you remember from just a few verses before, when the kings of the Vale of Siddim, Sodom, Gomorrah, and uh, Zebaim, those other two countries, I forgot the names of them, but there were five countries in total, Sodom and Gomorrah were with them. Those kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled right away, and they fell in the tar pits, in the slime pits. This king, who had just disgraced himself by fleeing in battle, wants to come out and be the first, oh, yay, look at you. And if you've ever seen any movie, if you've ever read any book, it goes that way. There's always some coward who wants to be the king, he wants to be the hot shot, but he's really garbage. And then when the hero comes in and actually takes care of business, that coward likes to come out and be the first, oh, thank you so much, you saved us. You know, well, you were the one who was supposed to do it, bozo. You know, you're welcome, but that's this guy in the story, the king of Sodom. And he comes out to greet Abram after the slaughter of Kedor Laomer. Verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. First thing I noticed here is kind of strange. Those five nations, um, I don't have them memorized, but I'll look up here. Those five nations were that were taken over. Um, they were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Which one of those is Melchizedek the king of? None of them. He's the king of Salem. He's from a different place. So the first question in my mind, Salem, by the way, should remind you of what city? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That's what city he's talking about. I'll show you scripture for that. Why is this king coming from the west to greet Abram, who just saved people from over the mountain in the valley where the Salt Sea is? Why did Melchizedek come out? That's a question I have. Verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after, I'm sorry, 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So, this guy, Melchizedek, so far he just seems like an ordinary king, but we're going to learn some very interesting things about him. First, it says he was the king of what? King of Salem. You're going to want to write these down. We're going to take note of what the Bible says about this guy and see if we can figure out who he is. He's the king of Salem. What else did he do? He brought forth what? Bread and wine. That's an interesting combo. He brought forth bread and wine. Can you think of anybody else who has ever brought out bread and wine? Like at the Last Supper in the upper room? Yeah. Who is that? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Jesus. Sorry. That's okay. He did that too. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, he brought forth bread and wine. Um, obviously, he met Abram, uh, returning from the slaughter of the kings. He brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. Now, if you know your Bible, right when you get to this point, I mean, you should be raising your eyebrows and scratching your head a little bit. What do you mean, priest of the Most High God? I didn't think there were any priests until Moses' day. You know, I thought Aaron was the first high priest. But right here it says, sure as could be, that Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God. That's a big title for someone to have. And it says, and he blessed him. So this man, Melchizedek, blessed Abraham, or sorry, Abram. And he blessed him and said... Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And that's a little confusing right there, but in the book of Hebrews, it makes it clear that Abram gave Melchizedek tithes. Melchizedek was not paying Abram. Abram gave one-tenth of all the spoils to Melchizedek. So, Abram... Gave him tithes. Very, very interesting. It's just kind of a strange thing. First, what? Who is this guy? Why the king of Salem, like Jerusalem? Okay, maybe that's a significant city in the future, but right now we haven't even heard about Jerusalem yet. Why is there an important king there? Why is he called the priest of the Most High God? Why is he doing the same thing that Jesus did to his apostles? Why is he blessing Abraham? And who is he to have authority to bless anybody? And why did Abram pay him one-tenth of the war spoils? That, those should be questions in your mind when you hit this passage. This guy's important, but why? Who is he? I've never heard of this guy. He hasn't been brought up in the book of Genesis yet. And really, he only shows up in two other places in the whole Bible. So, who is this guy? Melchizedek. Let's see. First, Tom, turn to Psalm 76 and verse 2. Psalm 76, 2. Melchizedek is the king of what? Salem. Salem. In Psalm 76, 2, the Bible says, In Salem also is his tabernacle, God's tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. So Salem, obviously, where was the tabernacle? Where was God's dwelling place? Where is Zion? Jerusalem. So when it says Salem, we're talking about Jerusalem. It's the same place, just the different spelling. That's Psalm 76 and verse 2. If you turn on over to Psalm 110, In verse 4, God the Father is prophesying about Jesus Christ, and he says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the law, the priests were after a certain order. They were after the order of Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest, Moses' brother, and all the priests had to be descendants of Levi, and the high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron. They were after the order of Aaron, after that guy. Jesus Christ was prophesied to be after the order not of Aaron, because he wasn't a Levite. He was, a, he was from Judah. And Jesus was to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. What was Melchizedek's order? I got some questions. Where was Melchizedek sacrificing? What was he sacrificing? The law hadn't been given yet. Did he have an altar he was sacrificing at? What priestly duties was he doing? Did he have a temple? Did he have a tabernacle? Did he have people he was working for? Who is this guy? And how is he a priest of anybody? And what is he doing in Jerusalem, being a priest of the Most High God? And why is he so important that Jesus Christ is after his order? 
Who is Melchizedek? We're going to learn the rest of what we can find about Melchizedek out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, quickly. Hebrews 7, 2. He's the king of Salem, which according to Hebrews 7, 2, is also interpreted king of righteousness and king of peace. In Hebrews 7, 2, it says, To whom Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. King of peace. Salem then means peace. The Bible defines the Bible. What does peace, or what does Salem mean? It means peace. So Jerusalem is, I don't know what Jeru means, but it's a city of, of peace is what it's meant to be. And even today, uh, Salem, it's spelled different, but the Jews, when they walk up to you, a greeting they use is shalom, which, you know, comes from Salem. Shalom means peace, peace unto you, you know. The Bible interprets the Bible. You don't need to study Hebrew. If God wants you to know the meaning of a word, he'll give you the meaning of the word, okay? So that's Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 2. This guy is confusing to me so far. I don't know who he is at this point uh, in the study. Uh, who in the world is he? God calls him the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Those are some big titles to be thrown at somebody, right? We know Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. So who could be the king of peace? I mean, that's a big title to slap on somebody. Holy moly, this guy must be important. So what we know is that he met Abraham on the way home. He is the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He brought forth bread and wine, which should remind you of Jesus Christ. He was the priest of the Most High God. What can we learn from that? The priest of the Most High God. It says, the priest. Under the law, how many priests were there? Like a bunch, right? There was a high priest and then a whole bunch of other priests. All the Levites. The priests, the Levites. He was the priest. There's only one. There were not other priests. He was the priest of the Most High God. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 6, Hebrews 5, 6, it says, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus Christ didn't make himself a priest. God the Father made him a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Man. Verse 10, called and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So this guy is a high priest. He's the only one, and he's working in Jerusalem. Okay, that should be clear so far. What else did he do? He blessed Abraham. And what else did he do? He received tithes from Abraham. Okay, so we've kind of gotten the basics of what Genesis has to tell us. Let's see from Hebrews what kind of details we can get about this man and who he was. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. Hebrews 5, 1. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? You know, God didn't send down angels to be priests for us. He chose priests from among men because men have the same infirmities. You know, a Levite had the same infirmity as somebody from the tribe of Asher. And because he had the same sins in his flesh and he had the same struggles as any man, he could sympathize and get along with these men. And a priest of men... A man who is a priest can offer sacrifices for other men, which means, you know, God the Father couldn't have done it. Jesus Christ couldn't have done it unless he became a man. So high priests were taken from among men. Look at verse 3. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, he ought to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, 
Did Jesus Christ make himself our high priest? Did he decide, I'm going to do it and go get that office? No. The Father told him to be. He told him, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Listen, talking about Melchizedek, Paul says in Hebrews 5.11, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. <laughs> Modern teaching says that when you're talking to your students, you ought to be real nice to them and tell them they're good and tell them they're smart. Well, here's what Paul said. Y'all are dull of hearing. <laughs> Y'all got too much wax in your ears, you know? Dull of hearing. He tells us all, you're kind of dumb. Y'all are a little bit stupid. <laughs> you're dull of hearing. And you know, you and I need to hear that every now and then. I'm a little stupid. And if I think I'm anything but a little stupid, I'm wrong. It makes me more stupider. <laughs> of whom we have many things to say. Paul had many things to say about this guy. Here's my question. This is all I can find in Genesis. How do you have that much to say about Melchizedek? How do you know anything else? It didn't give that much information about him. What do you have to say? Well, many things. And in chapter 6 and 7, he spills out many things about Melchizedek. They're hard to be uttered, and we have trouble. And it's not that they are hard to be uttered. He says they're hard to be uttered. Why? Because you're dull of hearing. He said, you know, it'd be easy for him to talk about it with somebody not dull of hearing, but... Unfortunately, you and I are dull of hearing, and it's hard for Paul to utter these things. And then he goes on, and those are our theme verses for growing grace. It's times here that you ought to be teachers, but now you have need that one teach you. So, let's see if we can learn. Look at chapter 6, verse 20. I'm skipping over a good bit, but I'm not skipping over anything about Melchizedek here. Chapter 6 and verse 20. We're talking about Jesus Christ, our high priest. <clears throat> he said, Whither, so into the... Holy of Holies, the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, in chapters 5 and 6, Paul makes it very clear in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ entered into the veil. He went through that veil, which there was only one person allowed into the Holy of Holies. Who was that? The high priest, right? How many times a year? Once. One time a year, the high priest could enter into the veil. And if he wasn't perfectly clean, and if he didn't follow the rules just right, what happened? He died. That's why they had a rope tied to him so they could drag his flesh out of there if he died. And because nobody could go in to get him, because if you entered into God's presence into the veil, you were done. Ask, what's his name? Uzzah or the one who touched the Ark of the Covenant? I mean, Uzzah. yeah. If you touch that thing, if you get in God's presence without permission, you're done. You'll just die just like that, was the rule in the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ, our high priest, entered into the Holy of Holies. Did you know that the tabernacle, the temple, was just a picture of the heavens? That's what it says in the book of Hebrews. Read Hebrews chapter 9. It's very clear that the tabernacle was shown Moses in the mount as a picture of what's in the heavens. If you read Isaiah chapter 6... Isaiah is in the presence of God, and it says, His train filled, what? The temple. the temple. God has a temple where he is in heaven. And the temple down here was just a picture of the heaven. God has an altar up there that we see in the book of Revelation. He has a congregation up there. There's all kinds of stuff going on in heaven, and the tabernacle and the tribe of uh, the temple in Israel was just a picture of what's in heaven. And just like the high priest would go in once a year to offer sacrifices, Jesus Christ offered his own blood in that holy of holies up there once for all. That's the big teaching of the book of Hebrews is that we have now a better high priest than any before, and this better high priest has taken care of the sacrifice once for all. Jesus Christ is better than anything else before, better than the priests. Here's the difference, and what he's laying out in chapter 7. He's not after the order of Aaron, he's after the order of who? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And what do we know about Melchizedek's order of priesthood so far? Squat. We don't know nothing. And Paul is about to lay out some things for us about who this man Melchizedek is. It says, chapter 7, verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, Priest of the Most High God. All right, we've got that. 
who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. All right, we've got all that. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Hey, the Bible defines itself, right? In Genesis, it said Abram gave a tithe. In Hebrews, it says he gave a tenth part. You say, what's a tithe? One tenth, 10%. That's what tithe means. He gave a tenth part of all. First, being by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Here's the description of Melchizedek. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now, a lot of people have guesses as to who this fellow Melchizedek is. Some people say they think Melchizedek is Enoch. Some people think they say Melchizedek is Shem. Some people say Melchizedek is Jesus Christ himself. Does anybody else have a guess as to who it could be? Throw names up there, like a significant... You, anybody have thought before? Nobody got a good guess? I didn't either. I don't have a good guess. If you don't, that's fine. These are kind of the big three guesses that people throw out there. It says right here, without father, without mother. We have Enoch's father's name, right? Mm -hmm. We have Shem's father's name, Noah. We have Jesus' father's name, God. We have his mother's name, Mary. Without father, without mother. Who is Melchizedek? <laughs> is he an ordinary man? <laughs> he didn't have a mom and he didn't have a dad. He didn't have descent. He never had kids. He didn't have ancestors. There's no one above him or below him. He didn't have a beginning, and he didn't have an end. Just right there, it should make you realize this is no ordinary man. This is an eternal person. You know who had a beginning? Satan. Every other angel had a beginning. There's only one person who has never had a beginning and will never have an end, and who is that? God. God. And God is three persons, right? Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's not the Son. Definitely not the Son. So, let's see. Who is, it's, it's got to be, this Melchizedek has to be one person of the Godhead. He's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but, this is tricky right here, made like unto the Son of God. What does that mean? He's made like unto the Son of God. Well, um, sorry, I'm trying to find my place in my notes here. Sorry? Said give us a verse 16. Um, <clears throat> that's, what are you getting at there? Well, Great is the mystery of godliness. Is that 1 Timothy 3.16? Maybe you're looking at 2 Timothy 3.16 is all scriptures given by Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first, 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 first Timothy. Yeah. yeah, God was manifest in the flesh. Yeah. And then it says there, it says there that, but made like unto the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? If this guy was made like unto the Son of God, that means he's not the Son of God. He was made like unto the Son of God. And it says he's without father, without mother, and Jesus had a father and mother. This guy, Melchizedek, is not Jesus. And that's most people's guess, is that it's just like when the angel of the Lord showed up to Jacob. That was Jesus Christ before his birth. And that was, you know, the fourth person standing in the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. And all the other times you see the angel of the Lord appearing to somebody in the Old Testament, it's the Word. People say pre-incarnate, that means before Jesus Christ was born of Mary. It was Jesus Christ showing himself in the Old Testament. The problem is, this guy, Melchizedek, can't be Jesus. Because he can't have a father or mother, and he's made like unto the Son of God. Let's move on. Daniel. Yes. My notes say it was a suitable type of Christ as high priest. 
yeah, type of Christ as high priest. Yeah, I'm not sure who that is, but what type usually means like a picture. Yeah, so he's a picture of Christ as the high priest, which is what. It's in my Bible. Not yeah. Something I've done. It's wrote. Okay, what the commentator did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I that's a hundred percent true. It is a suitable type of Jesus Christ, meaning it's a picture, and you know he's made light unto the Son of God. And all throughout the book of Hebrews here that we're reading, Jesus is made after the order of this guy. So obviously the two are very similar, but not the same. Uh, look at the end of verse 3. It said, He abideth a priest continually. So this man, Melchizedek, to this day, is the priest of the Most High God. Continually abideth. To this day. Verse 4. Now, consider how great this man was. Hold on. He's a man? <laughs> consider how great this man was. But remember, all throughout the Old Testament, God is called a man. Adam's a man because he's made in God's image. God is the first man, not Adam. See what I'm getting at? God is a man. It says the Lord is a man of war. He's not just a man, but he looks like a man, and he is a man, according to the Bible. So this can still be God the Father or God the Holy Spirit. It's got to be one of the two. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed them that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So right there, that's a lot of words, but it's saying, this guy received tithes of Abraham and Melchizedek was better than Abraham. The less receive, or uh, it says, the less is blessed of the better. So the better, Melchizedek, blessed Abraham the less. So he's better than Abraham, whoever he is. And verse 8, and here, focus here, this is a big clue as to who this guy is. And here, <laughs> where's here? Here, <laughs> men that die receive tithes. We're still talking about these priests under the law. Here, men that die receive tithes. But there, he receiveth them. This is real simple, okay? Here, men that die receive tithes. What do you think he's talking about there? Priests that receive the tithes and tithe. Here, men that die receive tithes. Right. The priests were men that were going to die, right? Just ordinary men who die. But there, where's there? What did he tell you? The tabernacle here is a picture of the one in the heavens, right? Here men receive tithes. And that priest Melchizedek, didn't we just read that he abideth a priest continually? He's still a priest today, right? Right? right. Yeah. He's still receiving tithes today, right? Amen. Where? Here. There. <laughs> Here versus there. So you say, where is Melchizedek today? There, receiving tithes to this day. There he receiveth them. Of whom... It is witnessed that he liveth. <laughs> hey, he's not dead. And remember, this has got to be either God the Father or God the Spirit. And one of them is receiving tithes in heaven right now, and there are witnesses that he is alive and not dead. We're not talking about Jesus Christ the Son. Man. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receives tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. Long story short here. Hebrews is hard to read through and comprehend it all. What he's saying right here is, 
in the law, only one tribe could be priests. What tribe was that? Levi. Levi. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, right? right? So he couldn't be a priest under the law, right? Mm -hmm. So he just said there had to be a change of the law. There had to be another, if Jesus was going to be a priest, there had to be some other priest other than Aaron that he could be after, that he could model his priesthood after. Who was that? Melchizedek. Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's what he's talking about. This is not talking about under the law. This is talking about something bigger. God's whole relationship with man, his priesthood through Melchizedek, was not bound to the law like Aaron's was. This is to any man on the planet that this uh, priesthood applies. Uh, verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Man. Um, <clears throat> look at verse 20. It says, and inasmuch, I'm sorry, verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. So the pre, for those priests were made without an oath. So the priests under the law didn't have some oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. If Jesus Christ's priesthood is unchangeable and continueth forever, who could possibly be the one he's modeled after? His order, the order of Melchizedek, has to be better than Jesus Christ. It's higher. You receive your priesthood from someone better and higher than you, and that's what this whole chapter is talking about. Jesus Christ is after someone better, after someone eternal, without a father, without a mother. Who on, in the entire universe could be said that is higher than Jesus? God the Father alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. He says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is who? God. There's one person above Jesus Christ, and that is his Father. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, all throughout the millennium, the thousand-year reign, Jesus sits on the throne. And then when that reign is over, in, verse, in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus Passes the kingdom on up to God. He gives it up to God because God is above all. That he might be all in all, I think it says in 1 Corinthians. There is one person who could have been as powerful, as important, as eternal, as perfect of a priest. Only one person could have modeled the perfect priesthood to Jesus Christ. And who is that? God the Father. There's only one person that this Melchizedek could be, God the Father. Now, there's still a question in my mind. I got one too. It's no right. man has seen God That's at it. any time. That's it. But here's another problem. Jacob said, quote, I have seen God face to face. Correct. Moses was said to speak to God face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. So there, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, when it says, Who only hath immortality, immortality and dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen at any time. Talking about God the Father. It is talking about God in his infinite glory sitting on the throne. Bing! No man has seen God on his throne at any time. No man has seen God at any time. But what I do know is that Jacob saw God face to face. Moses spoke to God face to face. And Abram was blessed by, gave tithes to the Most High. The one phrase that helped me out with this one question is, he was made like unto the Son of God. Did he make a new physical form to show up in? Like, wait, I don't know. I don't know the answer to the that, question. That of, phrase there strengthens the Father to me. That's why I, I said, the, the, what you just quoted, uh, 
He's made like unto the Son of God. Yeah, that's why I, I, that, I immediately was drawn to First Timothy. Well, I said second, but I meant First Timothy three sixteen. Um, so I don't know, but that's that's the that's the one question I got. Hey, I'm I'm with you hundred percent, but that's the only, that that no no man has seen God at any time. But there again, you got to take it. You know. Yeah. It also says in verse fifteen. For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, yeah. there ariseth another priest. The similitude. Yeah. Who is the likeness of God? The Bible says that someone is the express image of God's person. Yeah. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person. In 1 Corinthians it says, Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. There is one person on the planet who is the similitude of God, and that is Jesus Christ. He was made after the similitude of Melchizedek. I think there are about five different good strong arrows that point to Melchizedek being God the Father. And the one question I have is, if he's God the Father, and I'll let you know, there might be 10 people on the planet who believe that. I don't know. There might be 6,000. There always are. But not many people believe this. Most of them are going to say it's Jesus, it's Shem, it's Enoch, it's fill in the blank. What I'm telling you is, according to Hebrews, this guy can't have a mother, he can't have a father. And there are like five good, strong indicators that it's the Father. And it's somebody who is there in heaven. It's somebody who has been offering sacrifices as the priest of the Most High God before Jesus Christ was in heaven. Somebody, There was an altar up there for a reason. Jesus wasn't the first one to make a sacrifice on that altar. Who was offering sacrifices in heaven before Jesus Christ? Who was worthy? There's only one person I can think of, God the Father. So, who is Melchizedek? I believe God the Father. You say, what does Melchizedek mean? Why that name? King of righteousness, king of peace. If Jesus Christ is the prince of peace, who's the prince's father? The king, the king of peace. What you got, Brother Jimmy? In my Bible, in the commentary, from verses 7, uh, 7, 22 through 25, it says, as the author identifies Jesus, as the king priest who had come, his argument begins to make sense. Although from the tribe of Judah, rather than Levi, Jesus still qualifies as a priest in the same way Melchizedek did. He is the one who lives forever and continues to intercede before God on behalf of human beings. Yeah. Yeah, so Jesus Christ qualifies just like that guy. Yeah. That's what he's saying. So, either this is God the Father, or there is some other person who is higher than Jesus Christ, named Melchizedek, that the rest of the Bible doesn't talk about, made like to the Son of God, serving in heaven as the priest of the Most High God, and it's between the Father and Jesus, and I don't see any indication of that anywhere in the Bible. It could be, but why didn't he talk about him anywhere else? Seems to me like this is the Father, and that's hard to wrap my mind around because uh, you don't see throughout the Bible God the Father showing himself to a man. Yeah. One, one more here. It says uh, Jesus is superior to the Levitical priest in that he does not need to offer sacrifices on his own behalf. Jesus Christ is a high priest who is holy, harmless, and undefiled. And he only needed to offer a single sacrifice to God. The sacrifice of himself was one once for all. If, if, if effectiveness covered past, present, and future, the Levitical priesthood was not the last word in salvation. Jesus is. Right. Amen. Yeah, this priesthood of Melchizedek is greater and bigger than the law and the Levites uh, could ever have dreamed of being. And that's a really important point that Hebrews is making is that all the priests that ever served under the law were sinners just like you and me. But Jesus Christ wasn't. And since he's after the order of Melchizedek, that means Melchizedek wasn't either. This priest was perfect, without end of days, without beginning, no sin. Absolutely perfect. And it seems like it's the Father. Just doing a, just doing a word search of king with a capital K, hmm. which it presents itself in, in our Bible. Um, there's there's no king that I've seen in nine, well there's 2,500 2540 verses I mean I'm not verses 
matches. There's 1,917 verses found with king in it. Capital but just no, 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 with no, with no cap, capital. That's what I'm saying. So here it's emphasizing uh, in Hebrews, uh, and I ain't got to that yet. But I'm just kind of going through. I'm I'm all the way down pretty far, but I hadn't seen a capital K for king uh, yet. That's good. How many are there with capital K? Uh, that's where I'm, I'll, I'll let you know here in a minute. Just say the top. <laughs> Probably a better way to search it than what I'm doing. What'd you do? I typed in capital uh, capital K, or of course King, and then just I'm just scrolling through, and I'm, everything I'm seeing is lowercase. Did you type case sensitive? Uh, let's see, that's why I need your help. Uh, case <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that narrowed her down. Um, so yeah, there, there's the Lord is King in Psalm 10. Psalm 5, hearkening to the voice of my cry, my king, capital K, and my God. Uh, Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. So, I, I don't know, I just had I just had a thought to, to, to look and see yeah. about that capital K and I'm king. I'm looking at it too. It's something, there's 66 verses yeah. that have a king with capital K. That's right. And what I'm seeing so far, just like he's saying, capital K king is only referring to God. Yep. As far as we can tell. There's one place where it says King Agrippa, but that's because it's starting a quote. And anytime he starts a quote he capitalizes. So right. that's, that's different. That wouldn't apply. And uh you know, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, that's capital K. That's a good point right there. So if the there, King James in, Bible capitalizes that word king. It seems like it's talking about God. That yeah. makes it just there, There's one in right. Daniel 6 talking about King Darius, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to figure it out here. What kind of a silly name is Darius anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's starting a quote right there. Yeah. Said thus unto him, yep. quote, yep. King yep. Darius. Quote. When you start a quote, you capitalize no matter what. Quote. So that one doesn't count. Yep. Yep. So it's, hey. looking, it's looking like. Sure looks like it. Yeah. I believe the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold fast the form of sound words. Uh, there's a new Bible called the Modern English Version. It takes the King James Bible and just tries to tweak it so that it's a little easier for you to understand. And what I call that is a perverse perversion from hell. Because God put our Bible in the exact form that he wanted it. Right. Every capital letter is important. Every lowercase is important. Every period is important. And in the modern English version, they went through and added quotation marks anywhere there was a quote. God left out quotation marks for a reason, and they got a lot of them wrong. They moved commas where they shouldn't. They moved colons and semicolons and periods. It says, hold fast the form, not just the words, but the form of sound words. That means you shouldn't change one little inkling. When I'm working on my Bible memory every day and I go through Psalm 119, I'm starting with verse 1, and it says, Aleph, all capitals. It says, one, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. There is a comma after way. Blessed should be capitalized. If I say, one, blessed, you know what I've done right there? I've not held fast the form of sound words. You've got to hold fast the form. Every little jot and tittle matters. And uh, it's our duty as Christians to hold fast the form of sound words. A good example of that is, if it's a capital K, you shouldn't go, huh, those King James translators are weird for capitalizing that K. No, you should know God wanted that K capitalized, and right. he did it for a reason. Right. And so far, in 66, which is an important number, verses, yeah. 70 times it appears, 66 and 70, it's talking about God. Any questions at all about Melchizedek? Okay. Um, you don't have to open up, back up your Bible. I wanted to finish out the chapter because it's just a couple verses. So we finished with Melchizedek there. He blessed Abram, and he said, Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Verse 21, the coward pops back up. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. So give me back Lot and all the people, and you take all the spoils. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, 
that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So when he comes back, he had three brothers who were helping him, Canaanites, by the way, and he says, I'm not taking a thing from you, king of Sodom. I'm not taking one bit of spoil, except for what my young men have eaten and what the men who fought in the war took. And I'm going to let those other men who came with me, they get a portion, but I'm not taking a thing, which is a good example for you and for me. Even if you're owed money and even if you're owed a reward, you shouldn't demand it of somebody. And just like Paul's example was as a preacher, you know, it's ordained of God that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And it's good for the preacher, pastor, elders to be paid by the congregation. That's right. But what's wrong is for the pastor to, quote, be a lord over God's heritage and constrain them to give money. You know, I deserve this money. I work hard. You better give it to me. You know, that's the wrong attitude. Same with Abraham here. He absolutely deserved the spoils of war. But he graciously said, I won't take it from you. Why? Because you'll say, you'll go and talk to all your buddies and say, I made Abram rich. You know, no, I'm going to make sure that the glory all goes to God, which means I'm not taking a penny from you. It's wise discretion right there. Abram is a very good example. Any questions at all? Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. Pastor, you got anything? Yeah, just uh, a couple things. Number one, I want to say this. Uh, over in the book of James, y'all will notice, uh, I've been at this church uh, a little over seven years, and you'll notice, especially in the early part of the, my ministry here, you've seen me, uh, uh, and you've seen me call forth the deacons, and we've prayed over people and not all. The reason I've done that is just not knowing the scripture correctly, not rightly divided. I've seen my pastor do it a thousand times. He's seen his pastor do it a thousand times. Yep. And so it's just not rightly dividing the scripture. Now, in the last... Uh, several years you hadn't seen me doing that because I had some questions on that and uh, so learning like I told you learning to rightly divide the scripture will absolutely change your life for sure. yeah. and putting things where they go uh, so I wanted to be very clear on that because I know all y'all have been here ever since we've been here and you've seen that so that's that's why and then the second thing is uh, just a reminder uh, of service like we always do 10 o'clock uh, Sunday school and then 11 o'clock preaching and then 6 p.m. we'll have our Sunday evening service uh, invite somebody to come I know the weather's pretty and people find other things to do uh, but there's nothing more important than, uh, than us fellowshipping around this book right here and, uh, and getting in this book uh, so invite somebody to come and, and we look forward to seeing you on Sunday I'm done brother Amen um, How long have you been saved? Uh, since so I've been 22 so that's I'm 46, so 24, 24 years. years. I've been saved. I know it'll be 21 years here soon. I try to grow every day. I try to have my heart open. I hope all of you have your heart open. Pastor was pastoring and is still learning things. I'm teaching the Bible, still learning things. You should be showing up to church. You might have been going to church 50 years. You should always be learning. You should always be open to grow, and Absolutely. you should always have this heart I could be wrong on anything, yep. <clears throat> but the Bible's not, and I will always let the Bible correct me. And that's the heart we all ought to have every single day. And if you wake up one day and don't have that heart, then you're going to have a bad day. And uh, yeah, you, you better stay teachable. Uh, a very warm heart, humble and a contrite spirit is what God says. Okay, let's pray, and we'll get out of here. Brother Chris, would you mind closing us in prayer? Gracious Father, as we...